just could now. Yeah, hello. Hello, I'm Tommy. Thanks for being here today. I've seen a lot of new faces. All right, many people I know. That's really great to have a good mix. It's, again, it's, it's full of people. That's, that's really encouraging. That means that people talk about it. There's no, we do nothing here but let people talk about it. So they bring relevant people. That's, that's really great. So um, I'm Tommy. This is Darker Music Talks. This is a conversation, right? It's nothing but a conversation between people that want to know stuff and a person that knows stuff. Very simple concept. This is your playground. I'm not sure if he knows stuff, but we'll, we'll figure out. But this is a playground. This is your platform. This is you do whatever you want. Stand up, go to the toilet, come back, um, ask rude questions, um, just whatever you want. We're here to learn. We're here to interact. That's the main point. Um, so I don't know what else. There's not much to say, anyways. I would like to thank London Fusion for for providing this space so we can all be here and do this. If you want to uh, tweet while lovely Kunal is talking, please use that so everybody can can see what you're talking about. And I'll be there refreshing all the time to see you know what what bad things you say about dark music talks. Bomb, Bomb. and chaos um, theory. And, and chaos, chaos theory. theory. Yeah. <laughs> Who cares, Who cares chaos about theory. chaos theory? Yeah, people will after these people tweet about it. Yes, yeah, yeah, so um, so, so Kunal, uh, um, he's been, uh, he's the founder of Chaos Theory. I don't know if, if you work with him or if you know about Chaos Theory, but he's been around London for, for four years organizing events uh, with theme-oriented nights, and he has created his own culture with people following Chaos Theory, just about, because it's Chaos Theory. So whoever performs with Kunal actually gets discovered by new people every time. So it's really interesting, and because he has all the experience that we need today, uh, he will tell us a few things about how to approach live performances. I think this is a very practical thing, you know, to know. Everybody's performing. The first thing we do is we compo po compose music and then we perform. So it's going to be an interesting discussion. Questions in general is going to be like one hour and a half, uh, and then we're drinking beers. So enjoy and uh, yeah, let's have fun. Thank you, Tommy. <laughs> do I need this? No. Excellent. I'll, I'll jump. Sure. That's fine. Now, uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for the introduction, Tommy. And thanks to uh, London Fusion for funding all of uh, this, which is amazing, to be honest, that we have people like that still. Um, yes, uh, that was a good introduction. My name's Kunal, and I founded and run promotion company Chaos Theory. Um, I came to London four years ago to, well, as a musician. I'd been a performing musician myself um, for about 10 years, give or take. And I, that's where I came to London for, but I was quite um, surprised at the under, underground scene in London, or lack of, and it's just a few pockets of small gigs and venues, and they were just hustling to cram a load of musicians in and, you know, with anyone they could get and uh, make sure the bar was filled, and that was the main priority, but uh, very little emphasis on the music. So Chaos Theory has been my focus for the last four years, and we've been building that up. So um, it started off very, very small. We did... Um, very small gigs, uh, you know, underground basements of a pub or something like that, playing sometime. Bands would be playing to other bands, essentially, and maybe two other people. Uh, there was uh, one time I, I had a guest DJ, one of my friends who was a DJ up north, come down and DJ to two people. So it was very depressing. <laughs> and uh, well, we kept at it, and we built up a culture. We uh, just improved, plugged away at what we did, and we've had a few good people come on board, which have really, really improved the quality of the gigs and what we do. And... Um, it started to get to a point now where we play, we have a lot of really good high profile bands in a very underground scene playing to packed rooms. Uh, we have regular nights, which we do to showcase and kind of scout for bands as well, which we then use to put on special events. And uh, we started dealing with international names as well and using the bands that we use in our regular nights to support them and get them more exposure to a, a wider platform. And uh, I've just got off a plane about three hours ago, from Kuwait, where we just had our first international gig, where we put on a concert for the British Embassy and LOYAC, which is a youth arts foundation in Kuwait, to help 
young people develop their artistic tendencies and nurture their artistic abilities. So that was really exciting. It was a really good opportunity for the artists I took over, who I've worked with for four years, Joe Quayle and Bella Cardassis. And uh, it was just a really exciting opportunity for them to be discovered by a new audience. We got them lots of press over there, got them in print papers and stuff like that. So that's kind of where we're at. Still very, very determined to stay underground, not going to have any Pepsi sponsorship, as Tommy suggested, and things like that. But um, yeah, we're just hoping to reach out and help artists push themselves to a wider platform. So that's my experience, and that's why Tommy's asked me to come here today. And what I'm going to be talking about today is how to get the most out of your live performances as a musician. Because I've uh, seen a lot, a lot of musicians. I've probably worked with near between seven and 800 different bands and musicians and projects now over the last four years. And uh, I've seen a huge diversity and variety in the types of approaches that they all take. And I've taken a lot of lessons from all of them in, what, in terms of what to do and what not to do and seen what works and what doesn't work. So um, one thing that I have noticed a lot of is musicians will often bang their, feel like they're banging their head against a brick wall and just get frustrated and put in loads and loads of effort into their own um, performances and to just put so much energy into it. And they just don't feel like they're getting anywhere. And they get frustrated and then one of two things I've seen happen, they can either just start putting less energy in because you know, no, the motivation goes down and then eventually the drive isn't gone and the, obviously the less en energy you put in, the less results you'll, and the uh, less you'll yield and then eventually they quit. Or they put loads of energy in and they just burn themselves out because maybe they're putting their energy in the wrong places and they also leave. So that's the kind of uh, emphasis I'll be putting on the talk today. But just so I know how to address everyone here, how many of you are actually performing musicians. Okay, cool. And uh, are we have a few other industry people. Do we have promoters or uh, music entrepreneurs of any type here? Yeah, okay. Rudy, we met. Okay, wonderful. So, all right, so I'll try and touch on that a little bit as well. So, um, I'm going to be referring to this piece of paper that I wrote, you know, scrawled out on the plane. So, uh, it's very, uh, but forgive me for taking a little gap every now and then. So, one thing I have noticed is... Um, well, the people losing track of their own goals and they forget. I think, I think some people forget why they are performing and why they're playing gigs or they're not even sure in the first place. I see people just literally just peppering uh, their band out to, and just to every, every gig available. Everything. They'll just sign up for anything that's going. And I don't think that's necessary because there are many different reasons. But, I mean, uh, there are just so many different reasons why people can play and perform and become a musician. And I think people need to take time to think about that. So it really, I mean, you'll hear Tommy going on a lot about goals. And I think that's really important because I think any successful musician will, uh, any successful person in life will talk about goals. They'll have a very, very clear idea of what they want to achieve. And they will constantly adapt that idea with situations around them and stuff. They'll always have a goal and they'll keep reassessing their goals and then they'll work towards it, and then things will change, and they'll reassess and reevaluate where they want to be, and they'll always focus on that. So I have um, defined a few different types of ways that people can have a career in music. Does everyone here want to have a career in music, or are, what, are we, what are we, I mean, say, put your, I don't know, put your hand up if you're looking for a career in music, okay. And have you found yourself frustrated with your progress ever? Put your hands up if you have, or shout yes, or fling stuff. Okay, right. Uh, are we taking questions? This is a discussion, so does anyone have any thoughts as to why that might be? Why you're not making the progress? I've got ideas, but I want to hear from other people. Oh, well. and by the way, so we can get everything recorded for the video for everybody to watch. Let's keep it like that. So whoever wants to say something, microphone, blah, blah, blah. Okay, I don't... I think everyone's quite shy. Is that right? Okay, cool. Well, I'll just carry on. Okay, so the different types of musicians that I've come across would be uh, session musicians, for one. Very, very specific skill. You're a particularly skilled and trained musician. You can read. Somebody can drop some sheet music in front of you. You'll read it straight away and play it perfectly, and that's a very certain skill. I mean, that type of musician doesn't necessarily want to be famous for their, themselves um, as their own project. They, wanna, they basically tour the world. With other bands, I know a few people who have their own projects that they play on my nights, but they spend the rest of their time touring with some big names, playing bass, guitar, whatever for them, and then they make their money that way. 
And that's a great way to make money, and uh, that's one way to do it. There's also, uh, I've seen composers, a lot of people compose for other people. They compose for orchestras, uh, they'll compose for other bands, they'll uh, compose for dance groups, they compose dance sites, they compose soundtracks, they do all sorts of stuff, and um, film scores as well. There we are, so that's terrible plain writing there. Um, and um, uh, another type which I have had the most experience with would be performing artists. And uh, this is where I would break them down into two categories. Uh, I would say that the types of people I've met who are performing would be the hobbyists who Essentially, they are doing it because they love it. They want to play a few good tunes. They've written a few good tracks. They might do a few covers as well. And they just do it because they love it and they want to have some fun. They don't want to think too much about the pressures of trying to make it in the industry and all that. They just want to play every now and then, you know, get a gig in the pub, get all their mates there, have a great night, get drunk, and play some good tunes that they love. That's fair enough, and I think there's nothing... I've seen some people look down on that, and I think that's absolutely fine. If that's what you want to do, then enjoy it. Have fun with it. Why not? Music's meant to be fun. We forget that sometimes with the industry. It is meant to be fun. We're meant to enjoy our art. Um, so I can't read that, so I'm going to move on. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, business. Um, I think there are other people who want to make a business out of their music. And that's the other type of performing artist. And essentially, uh, I just think they want to essentially earn their income from it, which is what is the feeling I'm getting from the room around here. Most people want to make money from their music. So one thing I would say, if you want to really become a career musician, if you want to become a career anything, you have to get very good at a lot of other things apart from music. If you, uh, uh, there's that statistic that I keep hearing, uh, variations of, but nine out of 10, New businesses fail in their first year or their first two years. Have you all heard that? Uh, I would say, in my experience of meeting lots of entrepreneurs, in this day and age especially, so many people are becoming sole traders and run, starting up businesses, is uh, I've met people who want to be personal trainers or want to become hairdressers or whatever. And the business will fail, not because they're bad at the thing they want to do. It's just because they also have to learn how to deal with the taxes, the finance, the management, the promotion, the advertising, all of that stuff. And they have to keep that going while they're still doing that thing. And in fact, they might find that they don't have time to do that very thing that they wanted to do. So that can be really frustrating, and that can drive them up the wall. And if they don't learn to get good at it because they don't want to, they get frustrated with it. I want to do this thing. I don't want to do all this paperwork and all that stuff or printing, marketing material or whatever. Then that's where the business can go underground. So I think that first and foremost, if you want to do something as a business, you have to take it very seriously and realize that this is a business, OK? And whether you like it or not, if you want to push yourself to that next level, that's, that's going to be a required reality of it. Uh, I've just had the privilege of spending a few days uh, abroad with uh, two musicians who I worked with from the very beginning of Chaos Theory when we were playing in a little, small, tiny, little dingy room in uh, Notting Hill. Uh, one is called Bella Cardassis and one is called Joe Quayle. Uh, they're both amazing musicians and both of them started off very, very underground with me and uh, we basically played this dingy little gig in the pub, and we've all sort of grown up together in different ways, but we've all kind of kept each other on the level. Both of them are very inspirational, and you need to really see what they've been doing with their careers, because they have learned how to constantly push themselves to the next level and make money out of it. Uh, jo Quayle now has got herself a good network. She always has an international following. She's started to get good at social media, and uh, she always turns up at every gig with merchandise, and people will buy it. So even if it is an unpaid gig, she'll make money. Uh, Bella Cardassis will always um, find ways to monetize. She, she always makes sure that she can find many different ways to make money on it. She'll uh, do soundtracks for dance, for film, for everything like that, as well as performing and writing her own stuff. She's finally, after years of nagging, got some albums online for people to download and buy. So she generates an income without really having to try. Okay? It just it's a slow trickle at the beginning, but it just starts snowballing and it becomes easier and easier and easier, but you have to put in the groundwork. So I just find it really interesting to meet people like that who have slowly grown up over the years because nothing's more annoying than somebody who says they want a career in music and then I realize that they're exactly where they were four years ago when I met them and they still have that same poor demo recording on the MySpace page and uh, they haven't really put new stuff out there. They still play the small gigs. They're not pushing themselves. They're not getting more ambitious. They're not thinking about their audience. So um, that's, that's, a very, that's a real shame, especially when they are really talented. So um, 
yeah, even the, right, so talking about the business side of bands. Um, again, you can break this down. Performing artists who really want to make it serious, uh, you can divide them into a few categories. So there are covers bands. There are people I know who perform in covers bands, and they only do Green Day covers, or um, I've seen one guy who did only Metallica covers. But they were still playing the gig circuit with other original artists, and I thought, why would you be doing that? That's the wrong audience. Because you get bands like the Australian Pink Floyd, who are huge, make a massive living across the world from it. And Pantera Tribute Band, has anyone heard of them? Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know why, but they're massive. Yeah, they're huge. And uh, people, pack, they play packed gigs, and they make loads of money out of it. They make a living out of it. They've got, they've got merch, they've got loads of stuff. And, um, well, obviously I'm biased, I'm not a Pantera fan, but if you are, you can, it makes perfect sense to you why they're doing well. So they've identified a niche, the people who love hearing and seeing Pantera, but don't have it anymore. They've learned, they've gotten really good at their skill. They've identified the audience, and they've started you know, pandering to it and, uh, and doing that. Uh, you also get function bands. Uh, you get people who basically want to play and make money again, and they write their own songs, or they'll do covers. They learn a whole repertoire, and they keep adding to it. So they can adapt and mould to various events and situations. So you get a lot of people who can make a lot of money out of functions, and they do. So it depends if somebody wants a bit of ambient strumming in the background of a wedding or something like that, or they want a band to play at a party or whatever. Uh, the more you have, the more you add to your repertoire, the more... You, uh, the more diverse you can make your business. So that's, that's a route that a lot of people take. And uh, obviously there's the original artist. And uh, these are people who obviously want to write their own music, have their own name or their band name as a brand. And they want to project themselves and eventually be famous and get paid for their art, which is a dream that a lot of people have. So I see a lot of people getting confused between these, which is a major problem, because they are the ones who will essentially put all that energy into the wrong market. So you have to identify the market you're in. And there's nothing wrong. No one says you have to do one thing. Most musicians I know make their living from doing a bit of all of these things, uh, or a couple of these things, you know? And that's, that's great. I mean, at the end of the day, we're in a creative industry where we don't, we're self-employed musicians. We don't have a salary. We don't have that paycheck at the end of the month. So you've got to make money in whichever way you can. So yeah, do project here, project there, project there, whatever. Work for it, earn it, and make sure that you cover your whatever expenses you have. Uh, once you know which one or which ones you want, then you need to start clarifying what kind of audience you want, because they're all very different. So I'm sure some of us have played to different audiences, and we're wondering why we just played that gig. I don't know if anyone has experienced that, or is it just me? But uh, have you ever played a gig and you just thought, there was literally, I might as well not have been here? Yeah? yeah? Got some people in. The bar made a bit of money, maybe. And uh, yeah, why did I play that? There was no one on the lineup. Uh, have you, is anyone in a covers band here? You have been. OK. And did you play with other covers bands? Or what kind of gigs did you end up playing? Oh, wicked. Cool. And uh, that was a good experience? It was great. Yeah? OK, wicked. So that's great. So um, you obviously knew what you were doing there, and you found your audience. Uh, what about you guys? <laughs> Pub gigs. Pub gigs, yeah? And how did you, uh, why, why? Pub oh, yeah. gigs. So we'll get, if you can keep it as far apart as possible, we'll get Tommy some exercise and make him run between all of you, yeah? <laughs> So yeah, um, what, what, how was your experience with the pub gigs? Yeah, um, I'm, it, it's, it's difficult to find uh, uh, paid pub gigs. Yeah. Was that in London? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I managed to find some, but it's always like, you never know for how long it will last, if it will last. Yeah. If it's already over and you don't know. Oh, so you mean like a residency where yeah, you go yeah, back exactly. regularly? Yeah, Stuff like that. But yeah, there's no uh, security when you're self-employed, especially as a musician. So we can, we can, we can, make, we can, we can uh, soften the blow, though, and we can make sure that we cover ourselves. So thanks. They're uh, great ideas. I mean, what you mentioned um, is actually something that reminds me of uh, the guy who helps our press, Jack. He is a folk singer, and he doesn't want to be... He, he does Scottish ballads, and he, all he does is he organises uh, small gigs, gatherings in small pubs or co coffee shops that he makes an agreement with, whatever, 
and just plays to a few friends and a few guests. He'll advertise it a little bit on Facebook, and he just does that for the love of it, and it's just more of a gathering of friends. And that's also great. So he's taking a little bit of control over his audience and having a great time as well. One thing I've been told by the most successful musicians I've met, the ones who really do make a lot of money out of it, such as Joe Quayle, is if you play London, expect to play for free. <laughs> and she makes a lot of money. And I would never, ever dream of advising. I have worked really hard to make sure that the musicians get as much as they can out of playing at Chaos Theory gigs. Uh, but still, I don't think they're paid enough. I don't think there's enough money going around. And I think there's more we can do. And I think that it is a reality of London. The, the situation of London, which is where we all live, so we have to learn to work with it, is that there's not enough money. The businesses, they have the, the bars, they have way to, their rates are extortionate. They've got to cover that. So they put the prices up. They've got to put pressure on you guys, the bands or the promoters, to make sure that you get the numbers in so that they make the money at the bar. It's not just enough having a full house. You've got to have a full house of people who buy beer and buy drinks. So that's a lot of pressure. But um, if you concern yourself too much with the fact at this stage that I need to get paid 200 pounds or whatever for a gig, then you're actually going to end up putting roadblocks for yourself. Now, I'm trying to be very careful about how I word this, because I'm no way, in no way am I suggesting that people would undervalue themselves. But I'm saying that you can play to that and make money other ways, and then start getting to a stage where people will actually start paying. Okay, it's the same with the promoter. People, I have to hire venues. I can't get a venue for free, and certainly can't get a venue to pay me. But I'm going to work towards building a brand that is so strong, and that venues rep really value, that I want to be the first unsigned, or first promoter in London that a venue would pay. And that means that's my goal. And then I have cash to give bands. You get guaranteed pay just for turning up, plus a percentage. That's the goal. Very far off it. It's been four years. Not happening yet. I'm still paying higher fee. But the higher fee is getting less. The bars are getting nicer to me. So, um, How long do you think it will take? Well, I have to keep reassessing this. So as I was talking about goals, uh, I, to be honest, where I am now, I thought I'd be there two years ago. So uh, you have to, it, things to, we all hit roadblocks. We, that's one thing that knocks people back a lot. We hit a lot of roadblocks. Things happen. They slow us down. And you're going three steps forward, two steps back all the way in, in the creative industry. I would say I'm hoping for within five years to do that, realistically. Realistically, but a bit ambitious. Uh, if I could smash that and do that in half the time, that would be great. But uh, that would be a lovely goal, because then there's so much less pressure on the bands, and they can start doing stuff. Because bands should value yourselves. But at the same time, the reality is the reality. We can get angry about it. We can say, oh, well, we should be paid. Yes, we should. Yes, you should. You should all be paid. But we're not. So what are you going to do about it? How are you going to cleverly work the industry that we are landed with, with the economy as it is? How are you going to make sure that you still come out on top? So um, can, I, can I just ask a question? You can. Because um, uh, Ryanair managed to do exactly what you do, want to do. Like they get paid from the airports to actually fly to the airports, but they never fly to the biggest airports in the biggest cities. They always yeah. find those the shitty airports and shitty little small towns. Okay. And so that's something you've chosen not to do. I'm sure you could be paid by venues outside of London in other cities, but you've chosen to stay here. Why? Because, uh, first of all, I find... That's a good question, by the way. Uh, put me on the spot. Uh, <laughs> I'd say, the first and foremost, I find that London is a very, very creatively dense city. England is a really, really rich country for creativity. And I just think it's, we're very, very lucky to be here. For all the things I don't like about this country, uh, there's a lot that I love. And I don't see as much in other places. The quality of art and creation is high. Videographers, musicians, everything, everything, every, every type of creative uh, artist of any kind, I just think is really high. London, I think, is really, really dense as a city, a population, and as a result, the standards are really, really high because so many different types of musicians and there's so many different types of gigs available. People keep seeing each other. There's a lot of people who raise the bar, and as a result, everyone's standards are naturally higher. When I was living in a small two pub town, uh, and there were only three bands there. Uh, we, we didn't push ourselves as much, as much as we, we'd like to. We liked what we did, and we're like, well, you know, we're still better than the other two, so, <laughs> you know, that's fair enough. And uh, that's, that's a natural way, that's just the way the mind works, you know. You, you got, that's why I moved to London, to raise a bar for myself as a musician. Uh, ended up getting caught up in all this, but, uh, uh, but yeah, I wanted, 
the standards are high, simple as. I'm constantly inspired. We do different types of nights. I work with jazz, folk, classical, metal, post rock, whatever, just all kinds of artists, electronic producers, and the standards are really high. There's some really talented people out here. So I think with that, coupled with the fact that London is extremely difficult financially, I want to break this city and make sure that bands are broken in London again, because I can't remember the last time a major band, a real discovery, on the underground kind of scene that I like, not mainstream chart stuff, whatever, but even on the scenes that I'm into, I can't remember the last time a band really broke in London. They discovered elsewhere, then they moved to London, sure, but I want to make sure that bands start getting discovered here, because, you know, it's all there, it's all out there, there's such a rich mind, yep, go on. So you think that this will start by people starting discovering bands, by going to gigs without expecting what they're going to see, or just meeting up, you know, without knowing that their friends are playing and then leaving? So this is, this is what, why you do this? Definitely the friends and family circuit. I mean, that's very important. I always tell bands, you've got you to gotta tell your friends and you've got to tell people to come to your gigs. Major artists do that. They put it on their website. They put it on all their social media. They keep reminding people. They are major. They have millions of fans all around the world. And they have to do it, so why would anyone else not? So obviously, yeah. But uh, yeah, obviously that's a starting point. I want people to come who don't know the bands, which has started to happen at our gigs. I'm not trying to make this about our gigs and how awesome we are, uh, how, I th how I think we are. But uh, yeah, people have started to come who don't know the bands. They come just because um, they like the promotion and they like the gig and they think they'll discover something or they've heard it online. So yeah, it's starting to work. And people is quite a wide term. I want the right kind of people. I'd put on a contemporary jazz fusion night in Shoreditch for a while, and we just had bankers coming down really drunk and saying, Oi, why, why is there no singer? Where's the singer? And stuff like that. And I'm like, then, uh, yeah, you can pack a place with people drinking, but that's not good enough. You want, you want the right kind of people, the people who appreciate the band, the people who are into them, are paying attention, showing a bit of respect and not shouting over them, and uh, want to buy their merch, essentially. So now we're starting to get to the stage where bands actually are starting to make money on their merch at our gigs and things, and that's the point. Not just packing the place out to keep the bar happy, but packing it out with the right kind of people who are into the musicians. Am I waffling on? Yeah? All right. Um, so yeah, to, I've got a, I've actually was worried that this would be too short, but I always do this. So, um, <laughs> Okay, so anyway, back to the point. Um, I want people to learn how to invest, first of all. It's a business, okay? Invest time and money into it. It's going to sting. It really does. I, I had to take a major hit. So I had to change my whole lifestyle when I started Chaos Theory. I had to live in a little one-room studio crap hole with a, with a sofa bed, and it was awful. And uh, I was picking up food vouchers that I found on the streets just to uh, make sure that I could eat properly. And, well probably is you know, an exaggeration, but uh, you know, just uh, stuff to do. But I mean, if you want it, you'll make it happen. You'll find a way, okay? So you can do that, you can, uh, you, but you've got to invest. So as a musician, what do you need to invest in? You need to invest in time. time? Yes, yeah, you need to make time. Where do you find the time if you're trying to make your money on a daytime job as well or whatever? You've got to find the time somehow. People do it. The successful people always find time. Evenings, weekends, make time, find a part-time job, whatever. You will find the time if you really want it. Uh, what else would you need to invest in? What do you need as a new, as a, as a musician, as a, if you're running it? Sorry? Good recordings. Good recordings, yes. I mean, people send a lot of demos to me as a promoter. Why do people make, why did people start making demos? What are they for? To showcase to, essentially, initially, there were four record labels to say, this is our sound. We, can you get us into a proper studio and make a proper recording? Uh, if you send it to a promoter, it, gives a, it can give a wrong impression. I'm used to listening to a lot of dodgy recordings, so I can sort of get an idea of what a band would sound like live. But it's essentially, you want to present yourself in a way. It's like a CV. It's like a job application. I mean, you're not just going to send somebody a hand draw a piece of paper and uh, the CV, are you? You're going to make an effort. You're going to present it in a proper way. Same thing with your, with your recordings. Also, your image, whatever that is, or your image may be that you don't really have an image, but essentially you want a good website, you want a website which lays it all out, you want to idiot-proof everything. Don't assume that people want to dig through your website and find stuff out about you, because, I mean, I'm a major tool fan, but even their website was hard work, and sometimes I was like, you know what, I'll just hear about the gig somewhere other way, some other place. Yes, Tommy? Yeah, so one, one quick note on that, because I want to be the devil, devil, devil's advocate every time. Yep. So you, you were saying that the CV, I don't disagree that the CV, for example, needs to be great, the, the recording quality needs to be good enough, mm -hmm. but I think that we start changing this mindset. 
I've seen people with CVs that are not, not really CVs. They yeah. are presentations of what they've done, okay. the accomplishments. You know, th your accomplishments is your business card now. Yeah. So I don't think the CV, the traditional thing, you know, if you're going for a conventional way, then you might need the CV. But myself, for example, I don't have a CV. You know? If okay. somebody wants to see what I've done, that's the website, that's the link, which is getting updated all yeah. the time according to what I do. So even the same with recordings. I don't believe that you need to have the perfect recording. Like house recordings now, the, the quality is getting like really, really good. So you can get away with it, you know? People don't expect the perfection, but at least you can, you show some kind of like your mindset, you know? How you approach everything, this is what it is. It's not, it's not about the perfect quality. So I'm not disagreeing with you, but I'm saying that now the mindset is also shifting towards something more flexible, that it doesn't need to be perfect, you know? Just to show that we're, we're great. So no, I, think, I think that's uh, right. I mean, uh, what, the thing is, what you pointed out there was that you've talked about your experience and what you've done. Now, a lot of bands can send, like, uh, there's a band called Bast, who until recently had nothing recorded. They're a, well, a psychedelic doom band, uh, something like that, but uh, they're absolutely mind-blowing, but that's not the point. Uh, the point is, is that, uh, uh, I'll, can I just ask you a question when I finish this point about Bast? The point about them is that they had no recordings, uh, they had a horrible sounding demo, it was awful, it sounded nothing like they did live, but they played on stage supporting some really big names in that scene. And they made sure that that was on their Facebook and that was on their band camp. They'd mentioned that we've shared the stage with these guys, these guys, these guys. And fans of that scene would know who they were and that gave them credibility. So yeah, okay, you can get away with it if you have your experience listed. But again, that comes down to my point about idiot proofing everything. Don't leave anything to chance. Don't assume that somebody wants to dig through your website. List, have, have previous gigs, you know, uh, your social media links over there, your recordings, your music, your, uh, whatever you've got coming up, all that. Keep it, keep it updated as well. Generate content all the time. If you've got a gig coming up, put it up there. Don't, I don't want to see a band's website that has their gig from April 2011 on it as their next gig. Uh, that doesn't show me that they're interested in what they're doing and promoting themselves. So, sorry, yes, you had a question. Um, I think if you expect people to be putting their time and their money into coming seeing you and to, you know, going out of their way to, to be investing in you, I think you need to give them the best quality of your work possible and I think that means the best recordings possible as well. Oh, well, thank you. Yes, sir. Yes. yes. All right. Yes, I agree. Uh, I agree. I mean, obviously, there are realities. I mean, you know, we can't all do it. We don't have access to it. We don't have time. Whatever. You want to get something out there. But do the best you can. At least make it, um, you know, a serious CV of what you have done, what you're planning to do, what your sound is about, and what you've got coming up, releases and everything. Yes, Lena. Uh, I was just going to ask you um, if you could give us some examples of like your favourite websites when it comes to bands. Like, just give us some addresses, and we can just basically mm. copy their thing. <laughs> and now I'm going to give away this microphone. Otherwise, I'll just be babbling all evening. I think that website could be better, if I'm honest. Uh, uh, okay, I'm going to have to come back to you on that one because uh, I'm going to need to. I've got a few that really stand out to me. I'll have to, I'm happy to actually post some up somewhere that people can see tomorrow or something like that, because I'll, instead yeah, of rushing it. De definitely, the thing is because we don't have a presentation, I would like to have the notes, I would like to have some examples so we can post it all online for yeah. everybody else. I'm happy to do that, so uh, if you all, I'm all about the social media now, which is another thing I'll get into, which is the next thing, yeah, promotion, all right, so invest essentially, invest your time, invest your money, put it in, I mean most businesses, any business operates at a loss for the first two or three years. They lose money before they start gaining profit and the money starts coming in. I was very, very stingy with chaos theory and it didn't really lose much money, but it didn't make any either. We just about covered ourselves, but that was because I didn't really do much except put on gigs. We didn't do the recordings, we didn't do the photography, we didn't do all the other stuff that we do, live recordings, we didn't do PR and press and all that, and that takes time and money. So. I was very careful, but it would have grown a lot quicker if I had taken a risk and just thrown a few hundred pounds at it uh, initially. So it's up to you how you want to play it, but um, definitely invest. Now, the next thing is promote, okay? Promote, promote, promote. Musicians really, we all, I hated it, just telling everyone how good you are all the time. God, we feel like such an asshole. So uh, you just have to do it, okay? Just tell, you've got to talk about, you've got to write your own press releases. Writing about yourself in the third person, how much of a twat do I feel? Oh, you know, like, oh, chaos theory is an initiative that helps you. Oh, my God, I feel like such an asshole. But you have to do it. It's good. You have to sound professional. You have to sound like somebody else has written it about you. Do it. If you haven't got someone else who can do it, then do it, okay? Um, oh, by the way, sorry, I do get really quick 
and get really animated. I do understand there are some people who don't have English as their first language. If I have said anything that uh, maybe has gone over your heads, put your hand up and tell me to repeat that last thing. That's absolutely fine. Because how long have we got anyway? How long have we got? 